Frank G. Zarb School of Business. This, is, this class is Entrepreneurship 115. It's a required course for all business students, and we have a wonderful collaboration with the business school on this. So the Center for Entrepreneurship is open to all students and also the community and business owners and people who are interested in building entrepreneurial skills. And we have a lot of programs connected with what we do. One of the things we have is an entrepreneur in residence program where students and businesses can meet with entrepreneurs and discuss their business idea and learn about entrepreneurship. And what we've done with the business school is actually bring the entrepreneurs in residence to the students as part of their course to complement what's going on in the classroom. And we're happy to host this workshop with the Frank G. Art School of Business today. And I'm Dr. Leticia Vickery Gehrman, and I am an assistant professor of management and entrepreneurship, as well as the associate academic director with the Center for Entrepreneurship. And we are also here with. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Xu Yang, and also I'm a special assistant professor in the business school, and I teach both entrepreneurship class and also management class. And I'm very happy to see our students are coming here today. Right, and just as a quick intro, so in the entrepreneurship uh, class, both Professor Yang and I, we've been working on the Business Model Canvas, developing venture ideas using the Business Model Canvas as a tool. So it'll be great to see how some of the strategies that we've discussed in class gets reflected in the business ventures we're going to be talking about here today, especially given that Erin uh, uh, will be talking about how you pitch your business venture and then we'll also see a live entrepreneurship team, father and son team. So I'll get started with our introduction of John's Crazy Socks. John's Crazy Socks is a social enterprise with a mission to spread happiness. John's Crazy Socks has a selection of 2,000 plus socks, hires people with differing abilities, and donates 5% of earnings to the Special Olympics. John's Crazy Socks was founded by father and son duo, John and Mark Cronin, and they won one of the most prestigious business awards in New York. And beyond in 2019, the EY Entrepreneur of the Year New York Award. In fact, 23-year-old John Cronin is the first person with Down syndrome ever to win this award. I'd like to introduce John Lee Cronin. John is the co-founder and chief happiness officer of John's Crazy Socks. It was John's deep and abiding love for his crazy stocks that gave rise to this venture. John is the face of the business, giving tours, meeting with visitors, and making videos. John also performs speaking engagements with his co-founder and father, Mark X. Cronin, and they have spoken throughout the U.S., as well as Canada and Mexico, and now today here at Hofstra University. John is a fierce advocate for people of differing abilities and has tested twice before the U.S. Congress and spoken at the United Nations. Outside of work, John is active in the Special Olympics and is also known for his dancing. And I like to say when I talked to John and Mark about coming here today, there was no hesitation. They were really looking forward to talking to students and telling their stories and we're really excited to have them here today and hear all about their journey. And I would like to introduce Mark X. Cronin, who is the president and co-founder, along with his son, John, of John's Crazy Socks. His leadership has demonstrated that pursuing social goals, demonstrating what people with differing abilities can achieve in giving back, makes for good business. Along with his son, John, Mark advocates for the rights of differently of led people. He and John have testified before Congress, twice and have made numerous trips to Capitol Hill to advocate for the rights of people with differing abilities. Mark is a sought after speaker, having spoken at events across the U.S. and internationally. Mark is part of the U.S. State Department Speaker Bureau. I think we can hand the mic to John Mark now. All right. All right. That's great. All right. Thank you very much. Introduces. Then that I'm John, and I'm part of my dad, Mark Asquinan. And what's the name of our business? John Crazy Socks. And what's our mission, pal? Spreading happiness. Spreading happiness, right? And what do you want everyone to know about you? I want to let you to 
to know I have down that room. Down that room never hold me back. So thank you first for inviting us. We'd love to share our experiences of our entrepreneurial journeys with you, particularly if you're starting out. Um, I may be an old man, but uh, the journey is always interesting as you find your way. So what we'd like to do today is a couple of four things. We're going to tell you our origin story, because origin stories matter. And then we're going to talk about the social enterprise that we had created. We'll talk about the unified workplace we've created, and we'll share some of the lessons that we have learned with you. Okay? Um, and we'll have plenty of time afterwards for questions and to meet with you if you like. So, our story starts in a small log cabin in the woods. No. Uh, it starts in Huntington. You, if you're from Long Island, you probably know where Huntington is. Um, it's the fall of 2016, and where were you? I, I, I'm in Huntington Hospital. I, I just grew like you. And well, they graduated high school, right? Oh. But you were in Huntington High School, right? And here's something you should know that if you have a disability in the U.S., you can stay in the public school system until you either graduate or turn 21. So that was going to be John's last year in school. And you had to figure out what you were going to do next, right? I did. And what, what were you looking at? I, I look at. Uh, I look at a job, um, training, school, and... Right. And you see anything you like? Um, no. No. <laughs> and that's a problem. It's sometimes known as the 21-year-old cliff, right? We make sure you're healthy, we've educated you, and now you leave the school system, and there's not a lot out there for you. So that's what John was at. For me, I was 58 years old at the time, and the business I was working in shut down overnight. So now I've got no income, and I'm looking around, and I don't want to work for anybody else. So I was starting some online businesses, and we were trying to figure out how we're going to forge your future. And that's when, John, what do you tell me? I'm not going to be with my dad. I have a father down here. Right. John, like many of you, is a natural entrepreneur. He didn't see your job that he wanted to do, so he decided he'd go make it. He comes and says, let's go into business together. He said, now we got to know what are we going to do. What was your first suggestion? A fun store. A fun store. If anybody knows what a fun store is, please let me know. <laughs> Still can't quite figure that out, even though that may be what we wound up doing, right? Okay. What was your next idea? A uh, food truck. Uh, I can make here for the movie called Chef. Right. Because business ideas can come from anywhere. So food trucks sound like a good idea. We're having some fun thinking about that food truck. And here's something you can try at home. Go and tell your family and friends you're thinking of starting a food truck. Everybody's going to tell you what you should make. And you've got to tell them, get your own food truck. But we ran into a problem. We can cook? Yeah. <laughs> So a food truck wasn't going to be But then, right before Thanksgiving, John had his eureka moment, right? I did. I went down to pick a sock. My sock is fun, it's colorful, I love it clear, and you always going to be me. Right. And there's a lesson there, right? You have to generate lots of ideas. Not every idea is going to be a good idea. But John locked on to something that he knew and loved. And there's a chance that if there's something you care about deeply and know about deeply, somebody else will care too. That you might be able to go and find your tribe. So, we decided, let's go try this. And we went the lean startup route. I don't know if you've read or discussed that. I'd recommend a book to you called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Um, right? There are a couple ways it can go. You can stop and work on your business plan and do all that research and analysis, and that's a good thing to do. And I have seen those, and they are never accurate. Um, we went to Lean Startup Route and said, okay, we'll set up a website, got a little bit of inventory. We did 
So very little marketing. All we did was set up a Facebook page, right? right. We made some videos. And, and who do you think was in those videos? I uh, Right? <laughs> John talking about his socks. And all we had was my cell phone. Right? We were bootstrapping. We didn't have a lot of money. But we were going to set this up just to test the idea and see who could warn my socks. Right? What day did we open? I will open on Friday, December 9th, 2016. And here's a little inside story. We're on the Shopify platform. Um, they now, it's the largest uh, e-commerce platform out there. What time were we going to open it? Are we going to open it um, at 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning. The rule that would mean is take the password off the Facebook, off the website. Except the website crashed. So we had to rebuild it. And we opened it at 3 in the afternoon. And I tell you that. Because no matter how hard you work, no matter how much you plan, some things will go wrong. Um, so we opened at 3 in the afternoon, and we were very fortunate. We had a flood of orders right away, and almost all of them were local, which made sense. We were in temporary office space in Huntington Village. We, John was in high school there. We had lived there. So it was people we knew, right? And what did we decide to do with those first orders? For the, uh, I did that to home deliveries. Home deliveries, right? We knew. We were committed to being focused with customers. So we got red boxes like this, put the socks in the box, looked at it and said, this needs something else. What else did we put in it? I'm thinking of candy. Thank you, Thank you Noah Candy. Loaded up the car, rolled around. You're knocking on doors, handing out boxes of socks, right? Sometimes as late as 9.30 at night, you get a knock on your door and you're out there, who the heck is out there, Dave's trying. Just be with your socks. <laughs> How the customers respond. Customers loved it, and they put our food in the air, and I'll go as as I went. So we learned a lot of things. And through this, we learned a couple of critical issues. One, people want to buy socks. It turns out socks is the fastest, fastest growing segment of the apparel industry. Two, uh, people uh, buy socks like me. They want to buy socks from John. And also, I mean, they related to John, and this is the feedback we got, right? They liked the personal touch. Even those people we were shipping the package to, right? Because they all got a thank you note in camera. They liked the fact that we had already pledged 5% of our earnings in special earnings. And right away, we started getting very touching emails from families of people that had a, a son or a daughter or a brother or sister with different abilities, saying they found John inspiration. And we knew we were connected. Right? And we learned, you learn by doing. We got a little confidence that this young man and this old man, you, <laughs> we could sell socks. So we've gone on to create a social enterprise. It is a slightly different type of business model. Right? We have both a social mission and a traditional business mission. And they're integrated and feed off of each other. In the US, we mainly have, you know, in most states, you register either as a for-profit corporation or it's a not-for-profit. There are five states now that do have a social good category. There is an unofficial B, um, B corporation, which is not a government thing, where you can register to show that you're a social enterprise. But what it says is that you know, selling stuff and making money is not enough. Don't get me wrong, making money is good. John and I, we like to live indoors and you gotta pay that rent, mm -hmm. right? But it says there's gotta be something more. And for us, it's really motivated by showing what people with different abilities can do. So we went about to set up this business we have a very simple mission. What's our mission? Creating happiness. Now, you guys may not have had this opportunity yet. I don't really wish it on you to go to some corporate retreat and come up with a corporate mission statement where you parcel the words and you come back and somebody puts it on a wall and it means nothing. Here's a little experiment you can try. Go into a business or any organization and ask somebody, 
hey, what's the mission of this organization? See what the response is. How many of you were working there? A few people? What's the mission statement to your organization? My word. Me? You. I'm not exactly sure. I'm a personal assistant. Right? You're a personal assistant. But if you're going to have a mission, it's got to review everything you do. Right? So here's an example of what spreading happiness means to us. You've heard the line, the customer is always right. Nonsense. The customer can be dead wrong. Right? But we're not in the business of being right. We're in the business of making that customer happy. And so when you know what your mission is, it helps you make all your decisions. It helps you know what you're trying to do. And we have built it on four pillars. Inspiration and hope. Give it back. God, you can love. Making it personal. And that drives through everything we do. So the making it personal, to this day, every package gets... We got dick and nut and candy. Right? We run a pick and pack warehouse. We do our own uh, fulfillment. We call our pickers sock wranglers. Our packers are happiness packers. Every package, you get a sticker on your packing slip with the name and the picture of the people that pack your order because it's a personal connection. If you post to our Facebook page or our, uh, if you post a picture to our Facebook page or our Instagram account, John here makes a little thank you video. Anything we can do to make a connection with our customers. And when everybody buys in, then everybody is doing that. So we give out candy, right? And one of our packers one day said, you know, we sell socks for diabetics, and here we are sending them candy. So now we have a batch of sugar-free candy that we send if you want diabetic socks. It's not rocket science. It's just knowing what matters and paying attention. Socks you can love, right? How many different socks do we have today? Uh, we have 2,300 different types of socks. 2,300 different types of socks. That makes us the world's largest sock company in terms of choice. We have a sock of the month club. We have gift wrapping, gift boxes. We have custom socks. We now have greeting cards designed by people with different abilities. And here's one of the things that's really important to us. Right? We are competing with Amazon and Walmart and Target and the 20 gazillion sock companies. And we can never say, well, you know, just a small business. We can never say, well, look at who we hire. We have to match and even do better than them. So in fact, we do same day shipping. We do better shipping than Amazon. And Jeff Bezos is not putting a thank you card and candy in his packages. <laughs> giving back. Giving back is baked into everything we do. So we start by pledging 5% to the Special Olympics. Then we've created a series of products that raise money for our charity partners. And I'll give you a little entrepreneurial experience we can share. Um, so we got started in December of 2016. It's January of 17. Nobody buys anything in January. They spent all their money at Christmas. So that January, we had a total of 168 orders all month. And we're trying to figure out what can we sell. And that's when we discover that people celebrate World Down Syndrome Day. When's World Down Syndrome Day? Um, I think uh, 321 March 21st. 21st, because you get Down Syndrome from having three 21st chromosomes. So we discovered that people celebrate World Down Syndrome Day by wearing crazy socks. You would have thought we knew that ahead of time, but we're not that smart. Uh, so we go looking for a Down Syndrome sock that we could carry and sell. We could find one. So what do you say? I want to make one. John said, we'll go make one. They didn't think, you know, how hard would this be? What would it take? Just, let's go get this done. So John designed the world's first Down syndrome awareness sock. We um, had the design put up. We shared it on our social media. And we got good feedback. People said they'd love the idea. And we 
originally made it purple with lilac trim because that was the most common, the favorite colors we were selling. And people wrote back and said, what the heck are you doing? The Down syndrome colors are blue and yellow. Uh, so we have a blue and yellow side. Uh, but that's one way of, you know, don't look at everything you can't do, look at how do I get things done. It was only natural for John to say he was going to make that. So we have a whole series of products that raise money for charity partners. We donate gift boxes and auction items for charities. We now get as many as a thousand requests a month um, for people asking for us to donate socks to their causes. Um, we can't fill them all, but people know that's part of our DNA. Right? We also sponsor an autism can do scholarship. This is not something where we wait and see, well, if we're rich someday, we'll go and get money. It's baked into everything we do. So you know it's a copycat world. There are now other sock companies that are selling Down syndrome awareness socks and also autism awareness socks because they see ours sell that. Um, but it's not the same. They don't have John. They don't have the story. They don't have the commitment. It's not integral to what they do. It's just another product and another gimmick to try to sell. The most important thing we do is inspiration and culture. Who's the face of the company? I am. John is, right? And here's something to think about, right? As you think about your business, be who you are. We don't say, well, you have Down syndrome, or you have a disability, we gotta hide you, or let the other people do it. We put it right out front. So it's both hiring people. Today, we have 26 full-time permanent employees 18 of whom have a different ability. Over the holidays, we're adding staff. We're adding staff every day. So last year, we wound up having over 70 employees, um, the vast majority of whom had a different ability. It's not enough for us just to hire, but we want to shop. So if you know anything about us, you'll see we make videos all the time. We're creating content all the time. We take our process, turn it into content. And we're showing all the time what people can do, what people with different abilities can do. We host school tours. We host work groups from, from high schools and social service agencies. We take on speaking arrangements like this. So someone before asked what type of speaking arrangements were here last night. We spoke at a dinner for a social service organization. Today we're here speaking with you. We've spoken to a, a number at a number of universities. <coughs> Tomorrow, we're going to be speaking at a conference of sororities in South Carolina. And next week, we'll be uh, speaking at the Ernst & Young uh, Growth Summit in California. Uh, all to go out there and kind of preach this message of look what people can do. Just give them a chance. And advocacy is part of what we do. Um, if you have a disability, you are eligible to collect social uh, SSI, Social Security Disability, and Medicaid. However, if you work too many hours, you lose your benefits. And there are all these, there are lots of restrictions on what you can do. So we go to DC, and we talk to folks in Albany all the time about changing policies and laws so that people can hold on to what they, what they earn and have the opportunity to work for it. You shouldn't have to choose between work and keeping your benefits. And social enterprise creates opportunities for us. So you heard in the introductions, we've testified before Congress twice, right? right. And, and here's a little anecdote of what your business can allow you to do. Uh, we were down on uh, Capitol Hill one day, we got a call from a customer. We called the office, and she was in Houston, and she said, I see that John and Mark are in Washington. Are they really on Capitol Hill? Yes. Well, my mom is a big fan, and mom would love to meet them. Do you think that'd be possible? Okay, it was mom's contact information, they texted it down to me. Who was mom? Nancy Pelosi. Um, and so we're able to meet with Nancy Pelosi. They had a really, her and John had a great conversation about socks, and you both had given socks to former President George H.W. Bush. The former President John had become sock buddies and exchanging socks. But it also was the opportunity to sit down and say, okay, now we have to repeal the law that allows subminimum wage to be paid to 400,000 people 
with a disability who, instead of getting minimum wage, will be paid five cents on the hour. Uh, and you know, so that comes back to the social enterprise and the impact that your business can have. You can create businesses to change the world. So, part of what we have done is create a unified workplace. We hire people with differing abilities because we focus on what people can do and not what they can't do. We're not a charity, so we don't give jobs away. Everybody earns the job they have. Right? This turns out to be good business. There is a growing labor shortage in this country. Along our employers cannot find enough good employees. And yet, 80% of people with disability are unemployed. Here is this vast, untapped national resource that we want to tap into. Um, and they turn out that people make great employees. So what are the benefits of doing this? Well, first of all, you might think the benefits accrue to the people with different abilities. But in fact, they accrue to everybody. We have better productivity, better morale, better retention, people don't leave. And it helps us recruit people. Right? So as you form your businesses, I want you to think about that. The way I think about it, and I'll make an analogy, to Jackie Robinson and the integration of baseball. So you may know, hopefully you know, baseball was all white until 1947. And the Brooklyn Dodgers integrated baseball with Jackie Robinson. Here's one of the things that happened. The first teams to integrate were the Dodgers, the New York Giants. And that's the way we view hiring people with different abilities. So, how are we doing? Well, uh, if you are a uh, social enterprise, you're going to have different metrics. You're going to measure the impact you have. And we start with the number of people we employ. So I already told you we have 26 year round employees. It's showing what can happen. So the videos that we make, right? Like your hands videos, Sean? Right? Your cooking show videos? Our football pick show videos? They've been seen over 6 million times. Videos that others have made about us have been seen over 70 million times. So we're getting that word out there. We want to have, you know, we want to reach people. So we've shipped to over 80 countries. We have over 220,000 Facebook followers, 50,000 Instagram followers. We want to have, you know, we make a commitment to raising money. So not only is John an entrepreneur, but he's a philanthropist. We've raised over three hundred thousand dollars for our charity partners. Excuse me. Octopus. You're an octopus. He could be not this. I'm not stopping him. Um, we have happy customers. We have over 20,000 online reviews, and 96% of those are five star reviews. How many of you have heard about the Net Promoter Score, NPS? Um, it's something Bain, the Bain uh, Consulting Group came up with. You've all seen the question in the surveys. Would you recommend this company or this service or this product to your family and friends? Um, the way it works is if you answer a nine or a 10, you're a promoter, you're gonna help that business. A seven or eight, you're neutral. You, you're passive, you're not gonna help or hurt the business. So one to six, you're a detractor, you'll hurt the business. You get the score by subtract, taking the percentage of promoters and subtracting the detractors. So in theory, as long as you're above zero, you have more promoters than detractors. But you have to look at industries. So overall, the average score is a 30. The cable TV network industry, their average score is a negative one. Um, if you're a 70, you're a world-class organization. We have done this multiple times, and our score is a 92, uh, because we're connecting with customers. And when it comes to money, by the end of this year, we will have earned over $10 million in our first three years and shipped. 
over 80,000 packages will have shipped over a million pairs of socks. So it works. Right? So, you guys are students. What lessons? Well, here's another graphic just to make sure you don't think this is all easy. You can see the ups and downs. Um, it's not easy. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to have a strong stomach. Because there are going to be times when it's really hard. And there may be times when you just fail. That's the life you choose. Don't complain. You get to do that. You get to go and create. You get to go and change the world. You get to lead your ship. And all the risk with it. One of the things I point out with John and I is you think about being an entrepreneur. We have no excuses. We can't blame headquarters, we can't blame the board, we can't blame anybody else. We get to create a business the way we think is best, and we're responsible for our actions. And as we grow, those actions affect a lot of different people. And that's both an opportunity and a challenge that you'll face. So, here are some lessons that we can share with you. If you're gonna start a business, know who you are. You have to know your why. I would highly recommend it, if you haven't read it, to read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. If you don't want to read the book, he does a TED talk, you get the same gist of the idea, right? You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. What's your mission and what are your values? And you have to believe. You can't say, well, here's my value, except if times get tough, we'll do something else, right? We, you know, one of our core values is transparency. There have been some times we've screwed up. You know, one person goes, well, do we really have to tell people? Yes, we do. We've got to tell every customer, and we're going to make it right. It's hard sometimes, but when you have that mission, and when you know what your values are, that becomes your North Star and steers you. And when you get all the advice from all the different people, when you know your mission, you know your why, that will keep you true to your course. And when you do that, and I gave you the example of how we answer the phone, I gave you the example of the sugar-free candy, who we are makes itself manifest in everything we do. You can't hide it. So you have to know what matters and you have to believe. Don't go it alone. There are people that want to help you. You are fortunate here at the university that you can tap into mentors. But there are different programs out there. Um, we benefited greatly from participating in something called Mass Challenge, which is a business accelerator I kidded John that it was harder to get in that to get into Harvard. But they took these two knuckleheads from Long Island and sell them socks. So there's a chance for everybody. And we benefited greatly from being in that program. There are other programs around like that. You can find mentors. If you see somebody who's doing something that is a model for you, approach that person. Ask them, can I get some time with you? You may be surprised and how willing people are to respond and answer to you. And it never stops. I'm part of an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization. Real catchy name, um, right? But it's really important for me to be in an organization with peers of mine that I can learn from and I can talk to that have been through some of the situations we go through. But when you do that, you also have to be careful to get the right partner where you know, and this comes back to know your why, what are you about? Here's an example. I heard a talk the other night about getting financing and loans. Here's your choice, I'm living this actual choice. You get an SBA loan and pay 6% interest. Same amount of money, same, but if you do that, you have to put a lien on your house to secure the loan. Or you can get a loan, the same amount of money, same term, Paid 36% interest, but you don't have to put a lien in the home. Well, if you have a partner, two of you better make sure going into it that you know you're on the same page when it comes to taking risk. 
So you have to make sure, you know, don't be alone, but at the same time, you have to make sure that the mentors you choose, the people whose advice you choose, that you're on the same page. Take action. <laughs> we told you we, we went the lean startup route. Don't overthink things. Take action. You'll learn from that action. Everything you do is a hypothesis. Everything you do, you think is going to work. Go try it. I'll give you an example. It's 2017. We know we want to start a soccer and mug club, so we sit down and say, let's get this up and running. And we do. Within two weeks, we get it up and running. About four months later, I'm talking to one of our suppliers, who's also a competitor because they sell directly to consumers. And they had just unveiled a soccer and mug club. And we're talking about it, and they told me they had been working on that for a year and a half. We've been up and running for four months. We had revenue. We were on our third iteration. It wasn't perfect when we started it, but it was good enough to launch. And so now we had revenue from it, and we learned from actual customers instead of sitting around a conference room table wondering what customers might do. Take action. Don't let you know, perfection be the enemy of good. Don't you know, wait until everything is perfect. If you wait till it's perfect, it's too late. You've probably heard of Facebook, and you probably know the story of Facebook. If Mark Zuckerberg waited until we had something perfect, it would not be called Facebook, and it would not have started at Harvard. Maybe somebody at Hofstra was coming along and would have passed them. But he got it up and running, and the more he did, the more he learned. Right? When it comes to marketing, connect with your tribe. Don't immediately try to run to the middle and find where all those customers are. Find the people that are going to relate the most to you. John was wild about socks. Let's go and find those people in our core group are not only people who love socks, but people that work with people with different abilities. Families of people with different abilities. We connect to them, and then they spread the word to others. Don't be all things to all people. Come back to, start with why. Know who you are and what you're doing, and find your why. If you're bringing something to market, I think you've got four choices. Your professors may know more and do better classification. You can be the cheapest. That's what Walmart does. You can be the cheapest. You can be the best. But try hard to define what the best is. What's the best car? Who's the best sneaker maker? You can make something that's unique. When Pfizer came out with Viagra, they were the only ones. They had guys around the country lining up, right? It's hard to get that, um, to have something that's unique. But you have to find some way to stand out. And the best way to do that is be yourself. <coughs> know your why, believe in your story, and share that. Right? Um, and I will just share something because we've had a lot of experience with this. Everybody, if you're sick and nurturing something, you're like, ah, we can just do something to go viral. That sounds awesome. Watch what you ask for, you may get it. Um, in our third month, we had a video that went viral all of a sudden. And I'll, I'll share this experience with you, right? We now are up to selling maybe 45, 50 orders a day. We tried a pop up shop in Huntington, remember that? Right. And that afternoon, we were driving out to Patch Off. Uh, John, it was a place he liked to go to dinner right there. And uh, every time you get a sale on the Shopify platform, the default on your phone, you get a little ding. So I was like a little cash register. I kind of know me. Right? <laughs> it's, my eldest says it's like a little pheromone release. Ooh, that sounds good. So we're driving out to dinner, and all of a sudden, we get ding, ding, ding. What's going on? No idea. No idea. We're sitting at dinner, I'm looking at our Google Analytics, I'm looking at our stats, 
And I'm starting to tell John, well, you know what it must be? It's all that SEO work I did. It turns out an online journal called The Mighty put a video out that day. They had taken still photos of ours. They had just wrote an article. I, I know over 10 million views. Right. It's got over 20 million views. So we went from doing 50 ones a day to doing over 1,000. It's awesome. And it almost put us out of business. <laughs> um, and the other thing is you can't plan on this. We had a video that went out last uh, January from the BBC. We had oh, seen yeah. it. It's well, a video. I, 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 we saw it. And um, oh, no, it was really very positive. It's got over 40 million views. <laughs> At the same time, last year Google came in. But by the way, you can see where the money. Uh, the largest film crew we've seen had four people. Cameraman, sound guy, producer, reporter. And makeup. Well, Google came in with 23 people for three days. Brought makeup, brought catering. They made a gorgeous video <laughs> that they put out on Father's Day weekend. On that Friday, they put it out on their YouTube channel, on their blog. And on Father's Day itself, there was a link to it from the Google homepage. This is going viral. We asked them, what can we expect? Their first answer was, we have no data. Give Google. <laughs> <laughs> then they come back with some astronomical number. We get more inventory, we get people all to come in so we don't fall too far behind on our shipping. And then a big knock. <laughs> it's got 40,000 views, which is great, but you can't predict this type of thing. Right? right? You have to keep working. So uh, I want to share a reading list with you. These are some books, and uh, I'll send you an email if you want this, that we have found very helpful in understanding what we can do. There's a lot of overlap with these. Um, so, uh, if you're interested, you can send me an email and put reading list in the subject, and I will send you that reading list. Uh, we'll also send you a discount code. Um, Give you 15% off if you want to order some socks. Um, and I also want to tell you about something else. I mentioned the Entrepreneurs Organization. We are sponsoring the Global Student Entrepreneurial Award, um, and that uh, has a $100,000 prize to it. To qualify, you need to be a student. You need to have a business that's been running for six months and have at least $500 in revenue. So if you shoot me that email to my address, put reading this in the subject, I'll send you a link. I also have some flyers here. The first level is competing on Long Island, and that competition is going to be on December 2nd. Yeah. You got advice for people? Yeah, Dad. Um, uh, follow your heart, follow your dreams, so you can do. That's pretty good, right, Dad? That's pretty good, Dad. Uh -huh. So I hope this was worthwhile. We could share our entrepreneurial experience. If you'd like, I'd be glad to come back and tell you about new Gutenberg software, uh, which produced baseball for Windows 94, got rave reviews, lost every penny we had, um, and tell you about some other failures. Um, but somebody once said that failure is the tuition you pay for success. Um, Seth Godin, who's on that reading list, um, he says, the person who wins in the end is the person who failed the most because they keep getting back up. So, thank you for having me. Um, are there, are there, are there, are there uh, questions? Yeah, we'll answer something? questions. Answer and if there are no questions, you can dance. That could be lovely. Oh, oh, what I think. Right? And, and listen, the dancing, I joke about, John does like to dance. Okay. Uh, videos we put out just of John dancing have millions of views. Um, <laughs> And obviously, they help the business, right? And that's in keeping with what we do, right? It's not, you know, we don't want to put things out. No broccoli. Nothing your mother says, well, this is good for you. Okay, to watch okay. It, why are you putting out a broccoli? You know, it's a good example. Um, but you got to entertain people and show people what they can do, what, what folks with different abilities can do. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hi, um, I'm Devin Blandino.
you mentioned before that failing is the tuition for you pay for success. So I was wondering, what do you guys typically do when you feel like you failed and you just didn't get burned out? We have failed. And we have had our struggles. And, there's, and I've done that elsewhere. Um, to me, it's relatively simple. You have no choice. I mean, you might want to stay in bed and cry, but you can't. That's not going to get anywhere. Um, and what you have to try to do is you always have to be operating on multiple levels. Right? And one of those levels is one of self interest, you know, some retrospective, where you have to be able to pull back. Rigorously assess what can we learn from this? Right? Where do we go wrong? What do we do? How do we find our way out of this? Um, and you know, the part of that is just finding some way to make it work. And you can be creative. You know, one of the things I, I don't think we would mention, you know, a lot of times the startups, what they want to do is they, they start losing focus because they think it's all about how much money can be made. And they lose focus on what they're doing. They worry about money. I heard an example the other day. I was with my answer guy talking. And he was talking about it. He started his business. He reached a point where he didn't have the money to pay the rent. And he was going to take one of these fancy advanced loans. It's a terrible loan. Try to avoid it at all costs. Um, he's about to take it. And he got a call from a friend. He has a very successful business. And this guy now is very successful. He calls a friend when he's trying to do it. He said, but I don't have the rent. The friend just started laughing. He said, it's not funny. I don't have the rent. I don't know what to do. So I said, well, that's easy. You mail the check and forget to sign the check. That's going to buy you another business. Now, I am not suggesting fraud. What I am suggesting is when you find yourself in a difficult spot, you have to find a way forward find a way that you can do with less or create without something. So we've been struggling this year. We, we bootstrap, we don't have outside capital. Uh, we needed help with our Facebook and social advertising. I was able to negotiate a contract where we pay after the fact and negotiate it in on performance. We, for the first time, worked with a PR firm. And as we spoke to their various parties, this new agent we're working with, we're going to delay our first payment. And we're going to see her for our taxes. And so we find a way forward. The real thing that gets a challenge for one of these things is to know when to quit. Now you're in a situation where you have to take the job. And you have to know that I keep going forward. And you have to go through. Yes. That's where it comes to have some other anxiety that you start that are very much going to precede your situation right now. Thank you for the insight. That was actually very meaningful and actually helped a lot. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. You always have to make sure you're spending your time working on your company and not working for the company. You have to, you have to go to work at that same level. So we're working now to figure out what we're doing this week and what I can do on that and what we're doing for the holiday season. But at the same time, I'm looking to see what are we going to do next year and are we on a path to where we want to be at least you know, like Star Trek. No, no, this is all great stuff. So one more question while we transition to the next speaker. Please come to the mic.
Hello, how are you? My name is Nathan Monga, and my question is, may, may I ask what was your hardest fall and like how did you get back up? Sure. Um, summer of 2017, uh, we ran out of money. I was borrowing money to pay staff. So we ran out of money and I had to let everybody go. That was pretty dark. We believed that if we could just get to the fall, we would make it. Uh, that was pretty terrible. Uh, but we were able to find a way to get things done. And then we hit a fall that lifted us and took us off and was able to hire those people back. Um, that was pretty terrible. Thank you so much for sharing that amazing journey. Um, it was inspirational and it also the advice that you gave to all the students that are pursuing businesses was really helpful and we are so happy you came to Hofstra today. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, if you don't want the ride of an entrepreneur, you know, get a job as an elevator operator. You'll know what you'll do every day. And if that appeals to you, don't be an entrepreneur. Uh, thank you again. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Yang to introduce our next speaker. Okay, let's go. Well, um, our next speaker for today is our Mr. Aaron Haas, oh. who is an accomplished civil entrepreneur with five companies under his belt. In, 2000, uh, in, 2000, uh, in, sorry, in 2011, he was part of the Techstar New York City with, uh, with a side tour, a marketplace for unique experiences, which was acquired by Groupon in 2013. His current startup, Nomorable, has stopped over one billion unwanted and illegal robocalls from reaching consumers since launching in 2013. Norman Robert was chosen as a winner of the Federal Trade Commission Robocall Challenge, and also it was named Best New Product by Cable Maps. So Aaron has been featured in the New York Times, CNN, Wild, CNBC, and also Fox News. He lives in Port, uh, in Port Jefferson, New York. So welcome Aaron here. Oh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. Let's give it up for uh, John and Mark again. That was just, right, the lessons that they've learned usually, and I've done this presentation a lot, and I have to go into some of the basics and everything. That story is absolutely uh, what you should be following. Every entrepreneur in this room, um, that's exactly the path. And they were talking about the um, uh, EO, uh, EO, the entrepreneurship organization. Uh, as it turns out, actually, next weekend, we are doing our very own startup weekend. So if anybody's interested in actually learning all of the things that John and Mark were talking about, um, come see me afterwards. I would love to talk to you guys about um, bringing you in. It's a 54-hour it's a program where a uh, real, real crash course on learning everything about entrepreneurship. Um, so I know what you're thinking, though, right? Like uh, what, what John and Mark were saying about the story, right? You don't have their story. So what are you going to do now, right? Um, as I said, everybody's unique, right? Everybody has their own story. And in this part, I want to give everybody some tactical kinds of advice on how to tell your story and how to go and pitch it. So again, if that's a lot of theory and uh, really great stuff, now we're just going to go and get in um, how to pitch, right? And this isn't what we're talking about, um, obviously, right? We're talking about entrepreneurship. And um, let me get a, a, somebody here. What's your definition of entrepreneurship? Give me one person. Yeah. The ability to carve your own path. Love it. The ability to carve your own path in business. The official definition is entrepreneurship has traditionally been defined as the process of, of designing, launching, and right, right. That's just like really boring. But again, like just like the other speakers, right? Entrepreneurship boils down to this: making something that people want and selling it, right? If it's robocall blocking services, like, uh, like with no more my company. If it's socks, like with John's crazy socks. If it's anything, make something people want and sell it, right? People want this car. Who wants this car, right? It's a good looking car, right? People want 
what are these Yeezys, I think? I don't know, whatever the kids call it, right? They're like, people want the, this Louis Vuitton bag, right? People want this. Is there really any reason? I see two people nodding over there, right? You guys want this. I don't know if you, or maybe you're ignoring me. I don't care, I'm gonna use it here, right? People want this and your job is to sell them. And what's even better than making something that people want is to make something that people need. When people need things, it's an even easier sell, right? I'm saying sell in quotes, right? Uh, nobody needs this app. I don't know what it is, but it's like, I don't know, you sim stapler, right? How many times can you tap on it? Um, this one's a little controversial, so just the next one is, um, these are doggles, right? These are goggles for dogs. Nobody needs this. I don't care what anybody says. This is not necessary, um, right? In general, there's two things that people love to buy, right? It's things that save them time or that save them money. And usually Sharon is here because she worked for this guy uh, for 50 Cent, right? But in general, um, if you solve a real problem, your job will be much easier. Again, with John's crazy socks, were they solving a problem? Everybody's like, no, they were just selling socks. No, they were solving a problem. The problem that people have is that they want to connect now with the products that they're buying. Right? Gone are the days when you can just go into a store and you don't care what it does to the environment and you don't care what it does uh, to, your, to, your, uh, to your family or to uh, the economy or to the local, right? People want to feel connected to their uh, products. That's what the real problem that they were solving. So there's a little bit of overview, right? And the thing that I want to get, right, right what, was, what was John and Mark, what were they talking about all today? Right, they were just telling their story. Their story happened to involve socks, but it could have been something else. It could have been crazy gloves. It could have been crazy hats. It doesn't really matter because a pitch is telling a story. Okay, we've all seen presentations, right? You go back to class, you've given a thousand presentations. We've all seen presentations. If I could jump back to that guy sleeping, right? Presentations are boring. Pitches are exciting, right? People love stories. People love to hear what you're talking about. And this one is a quote that I love, right? Science tells, story sells. If you go and throw a whole bunch of, of statistics and right, that's a presentation. And according to the Bureau of whatever, the this and this and that, that's a presentation. That is boring. That will tell people about things. That's not your job as an entrepreneur, right? Your job is to pitch your idea. And in this case, I'm gonna be showing you a couple of, um, uh, pitch videos that are investment pitch videos. Even like, you know, everybody's like, oh, how do I get investor and everything like that? Uh, investors, you're always pitching someone. Even if it's not an investor, you're pitching a partner, right? You're pitching an employee. You're pitching the media. You're pitching, you're always pitching something. And if you're going to be going and presenting it to them, you've already kind of lost. So let me give you just a very quick, now I'm going to show you one six minute pitch. Um, as Dr. Yang presented, I was in a, 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 an accelerator called Side uh, in Techstars, which is a 90-day program. Back in, it was back in 2011. Um, just like Mass Challenge, it's harder to get into than Harvard. This is where I learned a lot of this stuff. So I'll be showing you actually a six-minute, literally million and a half dollar pitch, right? That pitch helped us raise a million and a half dollars. So I'm going to go and break it on down so you can kind of game day footage. We can see what works, why we did things. Because again, and then I also have a, a two-minute pitch from uh, Shark Tank. But after today, you're actually going to go and be able to put together your own two or six-minute pitch that is actually exciting and people want to go and watch it. So if you want to just see, like, this is in general a real good framework. Now, every single pitch is going to be different, right? Play to your strengths and things. But in general, what you want to do is get an attention-getting intro, right? Don't get up there and say, hi, my name is Aaron Foss. This is my team member, Jim Smith. This is, right? You've already kind of lost everybody. You want to get someone's attention, especially you think about it now today, right? You're fighting, everybody has a phone in their pocket. It's beeping with text messages, beeping with emails. It's beeping with Instagrams and the Pinterests and the Facebooks and whatever else. I don't know what you kids up to now, right? TikTok, is that a thing now? I don't know. I don't do any of that. But anyway, uh, right, you have to get people's attention. Um, yeah, it's just like with uh, John's Crazy Socks. You're like, whoa, tell me, even just in the name, John's Crazy Socks. It could have been John's Boring Socks. It could have been Socks by John or something like that. But you're like, oh, what's going on, right? Um, in general, as I said before, if you're solving a real problem, lead off with that. Super important. How do you solve it? I see so many people that are doing presentations that give me like uh, five minutes of background. 
you've told me about the market, and you've told me about this, and you've told me about that. And, and then finally, at minute five, you're like, and here's our solution, or here's our demo and everything. In general, what you need to do when you go and put anything, I've seen this a thousand times, just try this exercise next time with your group or anything like that. Take what you have and flip it upside down. Literally, everybody always buries the lead. It's always like, if you take what you have and just the last thing, start talking about it first, you will have a better pitch. Get to the demo as quickly as possible. Again, you saw with John, right? He was taking out his socks. He was showing you the product. Okay, how crazy are these socks? And talk about with the autism ones, right? Well, that was interesting. What, what was the colors? Blue and yellow. Did I know that uh, March 21st was uh, Autism Awareness Day? No, but now I know that was their demo. And it doesn't even have to be like, a, and now I'm going to demonstrate it. If you saw in their story, they were talking and they did the demo. They showed the box that they delivered. You don't have to go and stop and say, and this is what, and then show pictures delivering it. You roll it into a story. You need to have your business model. You need to have your fundamentals, right? A story is not a made up one. We're not telling a fairy tale here. Okay, so, and this is different for everybody. If you have a business that's going on, right, lead with the big numbers. And so in my introduction, right, we've stopped over a billion and a half um, robocalls from reaching uh, consumers. That's a really big number, right? When people introduce, I, I love the fact that uh, John and Mark have testified twice in front of Congress, right? Amazing. Not that I'm trying to one-up them, but I've testified three times. We have five piece, people, like five times people up on the stage in the last half an hour. have to, Why? Because that gives you credibility, right? If you have a, um, a position, if you, one of the team members on your, um, on your team has worked for Google, has worked for Facebook, something like that, right? It's going to be a little bit different for everybody. What's the market look like? What's your unfair advantage? What is the thing that you guys have in your business? Maybe you have a mailing list. Maybe you have a lot of uh, followers. Maybe you have something. Again, Every pitch is different, but if you follow this along, um, you're going to be a lot more successful than, um, than a lot of other entrepreneurs. And finally, and this is the one that is everybody ignores, uh, just like the intro, is the conclusion, right? Please, for the love of God, never have a slide that says thank you. <laughs> never have one. You know what? Everybody pick up your right hand right now. Everybody, right? I swear, I swear, never to have my last slide say thank you or any questions. Okay, so you've all like, you've heard it here. I will, I will come, I will rip the clicker out of your hand and throw it at you if I ever see a presentation, right? Don't do that, it's such a waste, right? You wanna actually go and nail that ending. And it's not just to tell them what you told them, tell them and then tell, like, right? Wrap it up, tell them the big idea. And again, you're gonna see these themes reflected in the uh, pitches that I, I show you, right? That's your time to, if somebody, okay, gotta get their attention at the beginning. The middle, you can get a little bit boring sometimes, right? And then the end, you want to end strong. Those are the things that people are really going to remember. Um, if anything, that last slide should have your team name, should have a logo, should have something, because that's the thing that's going to be sitting up here. Did you notice, and I don't know if you did, but like John's Crazy Socks, that, that logo was up for what? Five minutes? Yeah, five, it was on every slide. It was on for five minutes while all the intros were going on. Have one of um, you know, your logo and everything like that. It is a giant billboard right over there. Let's make a memorable closing. So again, to date myself, we're gonna, let's go to the videotape. None of you in this room get the joke, but uh, let's go show some actual videos. Okay. So the first one that I'm gonna show, here we go, right? I'm just, uh, right. Uh, yeah, should have been queued up. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. So what this is, is our side tour video. This is October of 2011. It's a six minute investor pitch at demo day. We're going to watch it and we're going to go back and we're going to go and dissect it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Far too kind. Uh, yeah. Ready? Uh. Can I get an encore? Do you want more? Cook and raw with the Brooklyn boys. So for one last time, I need y'all to roar. Uh, 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 yeah. Now what the hell are you waiting for? After me, there should be no more. So for one last time. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for the intro. Hey, everyone. My name is Vipin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Side Tour, And that, that's me on top of that elephant. Two years ago, my wife and I left our jobs, sold all of our stuff, and bought two plane tickets around the world. 
We did some amazing things on that trip, but it was the people who made those experiences happen that made our trip absolutely unforgettable. But when I got back to New York, I realized that I wanted to continue that sense of exploration. And I realized that we didn't have to go so far to experience life in this way. Because every city is full of fascinating people who can provide remarkable experiences like the kind that we had. When was the last time you had a truly remarkable experience in your own city? Think about that. When was the last time you really got outside of your comfort zone? Where you rolled up your sleeves and did something completely new? Where you formed a personal connection with someone that you just couldn't stop talking about? That's what Side Tour is all about. We're a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for unique experiences that are hosted by really talented individuals. On Side Tour, you could spend Saturday afternoon racing down the US luge track with a former Olympic medalist. Or you could plunge your hands into the art of fresh pasta making with a renowned Italian chef. Or you could have lunch with this investment banker turned monk and talk about his spiritual journey from Wall Street to an East Village monastery. I guarantee the only people in this audience who have done that have done it on a side tour. Our experiences are also inherently social. Every side tour is designed as a small group event, bringing together like-minded people around shared interests and passions. Our users are meeting each other for the first time at the beginning of an experience. And by the end, they're hugging and becoming Facebook friends. That kind of powerful social connection has kept people coming to Side Tour again and again. On the other side of our marketplace, the business is just as exciting for our hosts. Let's take Will, an aerosol artist from Brooklyn. On Side Tour, he helps people understand why graffiti is part of every urban landscape, and then invites them to pick up some spray cans and design their very own graffiti tag. Our platform allows Will to manage his scheduling, bookings, and communication all in one place. Every week, he can host eight people. Will prices the experience at $60 per person. He's making almost $400 in experience, which adds up to nearly $20,000 a year. That's meaningful income for Will, and it's even more meaningful because he's making that money doing what he loves. As he grows his side tour business, he can host experiences two, even three times a week, and that really starts to add up. As Will's building his business, we're building ours. Since launching our site eight weeks ago, we've held more than 30 experiences in New York and sold out almost 90% of that inventory. We've had revenue coming in the door from day one, and we're already seeing some incredible results. The average price of a side tour booking across all of our experiences has been almost $60 per person. So people are willing to pay for quality peer-to-peer -peer experiences. Each customer has been booking an average of one and a half spots per experience, which is phenomenal for driving user acquisition. And on average, six and a half people are attending each side tour, which means that after taking our 20% transaction fee, side tour is making $76 on every experience. And the potential scale of this business is boundless because cities are full of people like Will. Artists, musicians, chefs, sommeliers, even monks, doing interesting things that they could turn into supplemental income on side tour. We're talking about thousands of people in hundreds of cities across dozens of countries, all with something to offer the world. Our vision is to build a global peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for local experiences. This is a massive opportunity 
and we've put together an awesome team to achieve our vision. Aaron basically came out of the room coding, and he's a recognized expert in the Adobe development community. Mark has worked on design and product for brands across the entertainment industry. Minesh has spent nearly 10 years investing in and growing tech-enabled businesses at General Atlantic. And I've spent my career doing business development in the worlds of entertainment and technology. More importantly, we all have a long history of working together. Aaron and Mark have been working together from childhood to winning awards at the TechCrunch Disrupt hackathons. Mark and I worked together as part of the early team at Juiced, and Minesh and I studied at HBS together eight years ago. Handsome group. <laughs> We're also really excited that we've partnered with outstanding lead investors who share our vision in Foundry and RRE. We're raising a million and a half dollars of seed capital, and we've kept 300,000 open for strategic investors who are just as passionate about helping us build and scale this business globally. But we're not just building a business. Our entire team is on a mission. Because at the end of the day, life is a collection of experiences. And our mission is to make those experiences truly remarkable. I'm Vipin Goyal, and this is Side Tour. Thank you. Okay, so go go a little fast, we're a little behind time, but let's see what we got. So do you notice even before the presentation starts, it's already started, right? There's our logo, there's the tagline. Listen to the music, right? If you guys, I love, uh, if you can find like a song that you like and you like playing your, 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 uh, your, uh, to yourself, like to get you pumped up, Whenever you hear that song, you should come out and just have an energy, right? He hasn't said a word, and we all know there's something going on. And remember between the transitions and things like that, side tour, peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for experiences. At that point, it should be, hey, you know, that's interesting, whatever it may be, what's going on, right? That part, this presentation starts before it starts. This one's obvious, right? The attention getting intro. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for the intro. Hey, everyone. My name is Vipin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Side Tour. And that, that's me on top of that elephant. Right, same deal. Within, what, 15 seconds, you're wondering, okay, what does this have to do with anything? A little bit of intrigue. And then he explains it. Two years ago, my wife and I left our jobs, sold all of our stuff, and bought two plane tickets around the world. We did some amazing things on that trip, but it was the people who made those experiences happen that made our trip absolutely unforgettable. So again, you'll see this theme comes up a lot, is people, 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 right? This is all about experiences. This is all about regular, everyday people offering their experiences to other everyday, regular people. That is a theme that keeps on coming up. Were we solving any problem? You know, ah, oh, whatever, we're just playing together. Yeah, it's the connection that people want. That's what we kept on jamming. We tell the same thing. This, whole, this presentation just repeats itself three times. But when I got back to New York, I realized that I wanted to continue that sense of exploration. And I realized that we didn't have to go so far to experience life in this way. Because every city is full of fascinating people who can provide remarkable experiences like the kind that we had. Their marketplace, and they a really remarkable experience in your own city. Remember what I was talking about also integrating your demo, integrating your solution into your pitch. So even just look visual. Think about that. When was the last time you really got outside of your comfort zone? Right, so you, you rolled up your sleeves thinking. and did something completely new. Where you formed a personal connection with someone that you just couldn't stop talking about. Right, so at this point, everybody's like, oh, there's a couple of videos, a couple of, of images, and you think, oh, okay, we're going to learn to luge, and we're going to go and do all those pieces, and then we just go immediately into the demo. That's, That's what, what Side, side tour, tour is all, all about. about. We're, a peer to we're not stopping in the middle. We don't do the introduction, then when you stop, and then it's like, let me show you how to do this. First, you log in with your Facebook. You put in your email, and then you verify, right? You don't need any of that. You just need to go and cut to the good parts. Peer marketplace 
for unique experiences that are hosted by really talented individuals. On side tour, you could spend... Again, we're saying the same thing again, again, and again. Um, this one was actually kind of, the, there was a monk, right? That's probably the one thing that stands out because that was the one, that was the number one side tour that we did. It was this monk who was, yeah, an investment banker who became a monk. That's really kind of attention getting. Like, what is that? That's really interesting. You want people just to kind of be, remember a piece of it. Um, and by the way, you, anybody in this room could have done this presentation. Anybody in this room could have done this business. As we said, like we started, it was Techstars. It was a 90 day program. That's basically one semester, right? We had nothing when we came in. We built it on WordPress, kind of mocked everything up. We got it was Eventbrite on the back end. It was just a, we call it an MVP, right? In Lean Startup. Our oh, experience. Um, we built this in 90 days, just beg, borrowing and stealing, finding people that we knew to go and offer uh, side tours, getting the uh, word out, uh, putting this whole thing together. Every single one of you could have done this. This is nothing that special. It's just knowing how to are also inherently social. And social, we're talking about. Now we're going to go and tell the same story again, but we're going to focus in on one of the hosts, right? A guy that's a graffiti artist. Cool. How does he build his business? We want to get the, yep. He's building his. Now, this is my favorite slide. In, all in one place. Every week, here's our entire business model in one slide. And again, we don't stop and say, and our business model is this, and our business model is that, or whatever. We just roll it in. Now, at this point, you know what the side tour is. You know how the marketplace works. You know how the guests, they go and see things, and it's social. Now, you know how the host works. Okay, let's work on the economics. He can host eight people. He Will prices, prices the experience at $60 per person. Do the math. He's making almost $400 in experience, which adds up to nearly $20,000 a year. Two minutes. Okay, we'll finish it off. So basically, right, here's the whole thing. After 20% 20, 20 side tour fee. So you can actually go and see, right? There's, now everybody knows. Whatever this guy makes, he's taking home 80%. We're taking home 20%. Boom, it's right there. Basically, boil down your business model right into this part of the, um, of the presentation. And then try and go and amplify it. So then we go and multiply it. Like if he did one or two uh, a month, Right now, go and stretch that out over 12 months, and you can even see how he goes and grows it. Right, 20,000, 40,000, for Will. Right, 60,000, and then go and try and make it even bigger. So what we're saying here is, you know, right, like Will, there are thousands of people that are like this graffiti artist. Right, there's there's uh, uh, there's waiters, there's sommeliers, there's all these people, and then even just visually, if you see artists, mute, and we've put right. together in all the global. Method. In hundreds of cities, it keeps on across it. dozens then you of want to countries, show how big of an idea that something you can to do. Offer the world. That's right. Our vision is to build a global peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for local experiences. Go into the team, obviously, a couple jokes, yeah, ba 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 ba, and then remember what I said about nailing the ending, right? Life is a collection of experiences, and our mission is to make those experiences truly remarkable. I'm Vipin Goyle, and this is Side Tour. So yeah, end your slide, right? Nail the ending, take a bow, have people remember what's going on. And with that, I will wrap this up. Um, two, couple of, uh, uh, yeah, we can take some questions in one second. Um, just some other pieces, right? If anybody's interested in doing Startup Weekend next weekend, come and see me. I am an entrepreneur in residence. There's a few other uh, EIRs here. Uh, we're always over at the, um, in the business building, uh, more than happy to help you guys out. I usually have, I have a couple more examples too. So if anybody wants to swing on by, we'll probably be doing this presentation uh, later on. So if you really like this kind of thing, um, there's a lot of resources over. We're more than happy to give you as, as much time as, as you want. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time. Really appreciate that. And uh, thank you.